Good morning to everybody. I, uh, I want to just start out by saying what a pleasure it is to be here in your company. Um, I've followed many of you over my career, and the fact that I am where I am is, is strictly due to, uh, to uh, following the research and, and making sure that I knew exactly what was happening and, and, and the best practices that were out there, uh, and, and you're responsible for getting that information to us. Tragically, our field doesn't follow it as closely as we should, and I'm going to talk about that uh, at, the, uh, at the end of my presentation um, as to how we might be able to improve that. Uh, but I want to thank John for giving me the opportunity to be here and to, uh, and to talk about this uh, tremendous study. I think Rob and his team did an incredible job in moving the field forward and, uh, and improving our understanding of things like perception and trust and, and uh, issues that we talk a lot about but we don't really understand very well. And, uh, and so, so this information is actually helpful to what I do and how I do it, and that's really the crux of the importance of academic research. Um, you, you couldn't imagine the medical profession operating without informed um, experiments, and, and that should not be the case in our business either. Now, I'm going to make a fast confession. Um, this is not my tie. This, uh, this tie and the fact that I keep touching my collar, I have no collar stays and I did not bring a tie. My friend John gave me a tie, thank you John, and, um, and I still have problems with the collar stay. So if my collar goes up, my apologies to everybody. <laughs> Why do I tell you that story? Well, I thought to myself last night, how could you forget your tie and your collar stays? Are you, are you an idiot? Um, do you disrespect the people who have come here? I want to make a good impression. Neither of those things are the case. Um, I reflected on my week last week. From Tuesday to Saturday, I had a police officer shot. I had the Bruins win the Stanley Cup. I had an academy, thank you, I had an academy graduation. And then I had the Bruins parade after the Stanley Cup. So to say the least, I had a busy week. And um, I, uh, I forgot a couple of things. Um, I don't tell you that story because I'm boasting about the Bruins, because I remember many years ago when we couldn't win anything in Boston and, uh, and we used to hate the Yankees because they won everything and now, now we're in that same boat so I understand people's sensitivity about it. But I tell you that story because I, I, I want you to know that the fact that my colleagues don't pay attention as much as they should to the research is because they're caught up in that tumult of running police agencies. It makes it very, very difficult to sit back and reflect on scholarly research when they're batting the doors down with all of these exciting things that happen to us day in and day out. But we've got to figure out a way to be better at that, and uh, we need you to, to, to work closely with us on that with the kind of experimentation that Rob Sampson has, uh, has outlined today. So let me just talk about a few things. Um, I, I've got four points to make and very short time to do it in. Uh, collected, collective efficacy uh, is extremely important to us. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the trust issue that we've all been working on. And from a very visceral standpoint as a police commissioner, I know that if we don't have trust with the community, people won't report crimes to us, they won't cooperate with us when crime occurs, and we can't do our fundamental job of uh, prosecuting people and, and making sure that people are held accountable for the crimes that they commit. But, but the reasons for that uh, for that lack of trust. And the reasons for those problems uh, with people's cynicism with the criminal justice system are rooted in exactly what we've been doing wrong over the last 20 years. Um, I remember when I first came to Boston, I, uh, I listened to people. I went out into the community. I talked to community members all over the place. And there were some areas that were very happy with the police. And there were some areas that were very angry with the police. And, and I remember the very first time uh, that I went to a community meeting in Roxbury, uh, I, I was beaten up pretty badly. The people at the meeting were all parents of victims of, uh, not only homicide victims, but, but victims of shootings and crime. And um, the perception was clear that they didn't trust the Boston police to care about following up on those crimes. Uh, there were mothers that said, my son was shot and nobody ever investigated it. Nobody ever came to our house to talk to us. Nobody ever did this and nobody ever did that. Um, there were murder victims who had not been contacted after the homicide uh, 
the initial investigation, and they felt that a year later or two years later, nobody cared about the case. And so I knew that my work was cut out for me there. Um, I also found out by going out into the uh, enforcement units, um, and, and one in particular, the Mobile Operations Patrol, MOP we call it. Mobile Operations are the motorcycle guys. I happen to ride a motorcycle, so I go out on patrol with them, and I talk to them about what they do. And I realized that in the Boston Police Department, MOP is one of the first units that they send into a troubled neighborhood. If there's a problem, an eruption of violence, uh, a homicide that occurs or a shooting that occurs, MOP goes in. So I talk to the guys on the street and I say to them, what is it that you're doing there when you go in? What's your mission? Well, they tell us, they tell me that the mission is numbers. We want a lot of violations written. We want to stop a lot of people, and we want to enforce the law and make sure that all the bad guys get taken off the street. A certainly understandable response to a surge of violence in a neighborhood. But when you look at the people that get the law enforced against them, it's not the people that are actually shooting. They're too wise to our ways. They're not carrying guns in their cars. They know we're going to come in after an incident like that. They understand how to get underneath the radar when that enforcement happens. But if the MOP unit has a message from the administration to increase enforcement, they literally increase it against the whole neighborhood. And people feel that. One of the big things that were told to me at the community meeting that first time was, um, we don't like Operation Rolling Thunder. Heavens, I can't imagine why you wouldn't like Operation Rolling Thunder. It's fine for people to hear that the police department's going to do Operation Rolling Thunder in a troubled neighborhood. It's not so fine to the people who live in the neighborhood. They're getting rolled over. So I made it clear that there would be no more Operation Rolling Thunder. And, and I made it clear to the officers that we are not going in simply trying to increase enforcement across the board and rack up numbers. Because that policy creates the numbers that Rob talked about, a 40 times increase in incarceration rates in neighborhoods where violence is occurring. In the very neighborhoods that we should be lifting people up to help us and to engage us in that war against crime, um, we're alienating. We're alienating the very people that we need to work with us through our, through our policies, well-intentioned policies, policies that we believe will help, but policies that don't take into effect this issue of collective efficacy. efficacy. Um, one of the neighborhoods that you saw that had high levels of collective, collective efficacy is Southie. Southie is a, uh, a neighborhood in transition. It was a largely Irish neighborhood, famous because of the activities of a guy by the name of Whitey Bulger. Whitey Bulger was a, uh, is on the, the FBI's 10 most wanted list right under Osama, who's no longer there. And um, a guy that um, is responsible or is being charged with 19 homicides. But there was very little crime in Southie other than this organized criminal one-on-one -on -one that was going on. There were very few armed robberies. There were very few drug deals. Uh, there were very few things happening in the neighborhoods. As a matter of fact, the, the local law was that Whitey wouldn't have let drug dealers set up in Southie. After the investigation, we found that was not true that Whitey was actually profiting out over the drug deals. It wasn't Whitey. It was the neighborhood. It was the collective efficacy of Irish immigrants who came to that community and made sure that certain things didn't happen in their neighborhood. We see it now in East Boston. East Boston is largely Latino. Many South American immigrants. The first generation immigrants into our city keep those neighborhoods safe, those small enclaves of people who have joined together in a, from a foreign country are not areas that are full of crime. I had the same experience when I was in Lowell, largely Cambodian community, had immigrated to Lowell after the, uh, the Khmer Rouge had run roughshod over the community in, in their native uh, country. And in spite of the fact that there were Khmer Rouge who immigrated with them, the good people and the bad people, if you will, from Cambodia, there was very little violence and crime in the first generation of people who moved to our country. But the second generation got to be a problem. They ganged up. 
they formed gangs to protect themselves against the American gangs that were there. Uh, I've seen the same dynamic in Cape Verde, where the Cape Verdean officials have called us and said, you are deporting people back to our country and they are bringing gang problems with them. We've never had gang problems on the island. So the first generation Cape Verdean immigrants were not a problem. The second generation have been, and some of their children have been, have been sent back, some of the children of the first generation have actually been sent back because of uh, their connections with gangs. It's a, it's, it's a dynamic that I've seen over and over again, and Rob's work plays that out. So we're very, very lucky to, uh, to have this kind of information. Um, the, the relationship uh, between crime and disorder is, is one issue uh, that I find quite interesting in this study. First of all, it's, it's, it's brilliantly done, the way that they've measured crime and disorder here. Uh, to have a van drive around with, uh, with uh, video on it and to be documenting each one of the potential problems that you see broken glass, graffiti, uh, the types of disorder that our offices are constantly working on. Um, and, and being able to quantify that, it's almost like you, you have a scientific process that establishes a mathematical equation um, to something that is only, has only been felt before. We, we, know, we know neighborhoods that are full of disorder, when you drive into them, you can feel it. But I, di I didn't think anyone would ever be able to say this neighborhood has X and this neighborhood has Y. But I think Rob has done a tremendous job in establishing a process that would measure that. And his findings are interesting to me. I think that generally um, he's clearly correct in his, in his assessment. But what do I tell my cops to do? What is it that I tell my officers that they should be concentrating on out there on the street. We talked about collective efficacy. So in one neighborhood, which was described as the least organized neighborhood in our city, the Mattapan neighborhood, it was at the base of that, uh, of that swath of shootings that occurred right down the Blue Hill Avenue corridor in the city. That particular area is critical, and I put a captain in there that I knew was very good with the community. That captain actually did community organizing, grassroots community organizing, to increase our participation with the community and to increase the trust between police and the people who live there. And one of the ways that they did this, and this may go to the perception rather than the reality of things, because perception is where I, I deal all the time. But by being the front end for city services on these disorder issues, the police were seen as doing something other than just putting kids in jail. That they were good for something in the city. And so what we've been able to accomplish there is by increasing the cooperation among the police and the community and pulling people together to work on problems like graffiti, to work on problems like storefronts, to work on problems uh, like uh, gangs congregating in certain areas. The police have been the front end. The people have been hesitant to talk about it. They've been afraid. So the police end up being the front end for city services. It's a very effective way to show that they can be more to the community than simply the people who put kids in jail. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about action research. Applied research, the type of work that Rob does. And especially to the younger researchers out there who are trying to decide how to go here. My colleagues and I need your help. Many of us realize that, some don't. But all of us need your help. This business doesn't work unless we understand exactly why crime occurs. And this kind of information that gives us hands-on, real-time um, knowledge of, of what we should be doing and how we should be directing our officers will make a difference in the long run. It raises our, profession, our, our, our occupation to a profession if we listen carefully, if we, strong, if we tie uh, a stronger uh, a bond with, with the people who are in this room. I encourage my colleagues to do that. There should be many more of them in this room watching the, th this presentation and other presentations that will happen over the next two days. Just an analogy. 
It's the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And um, even though I had the kind of week that I had this past week, I took time out to sit down and read this study and to prepare for this presentation and to understand what topics you were covering in the next couple of days. It's the 150th year, uh, anniversary of the Civil War. If you were a Civil War researcher today, how much would you give to be at Gettysburg, to be at Appomattox, to be at any of the battles that occurred in the Civil War? That's exactly what's happening on the streets of our city today. We are engaged in, 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 in criminal activity where lives are being lost. Your being there, your being present, can make all the difference, literally difference between life and death. If we do our jobs properly, that crime rate will continue to decrease and people's trust in the system will increase. This past week, two things happened to me that I think are extremely important after four years of pushing these, these policies and making connections that, that I believe are stronger in Boston than what, uh, than what Rob had to say. The first one was, one of our officers um, was approached by an individual in Mattapan who told him that Johnny Jones came into my neighborhood the last three nights and shot up my neighborhood. You gotta do something about him. That wouldn't have happened four years ago. He stood up, he told us what was going on. This was in the least organized, most troubled neighborhood in the city. The other thing is, I talked to a guy from a salvage company the other day, I saw him cutting the, uh, the steel grates off a of business. And I said to him, what are you taking those off there for? He said, oh man, it's happening all over the city. Everybody's cutting these things down. Those are the kind of things that we have to look for. Thank you.